This is Judith Lay saying Moromai as the island's Christian community is once again at your service. Manx Radio. Good morning and welcome to the programme that's aiming to lift us up whilst we're locked down. Today is Palm Sunday, the first day of a week that the Christian Church calls Holy. Today we recall Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, yet greeted like a king by the huge crowds cheering and shouting his praises. So how could a week that begins with so much joy and excitement end with a sordid and painful death, and yet still we call it Holy Week, and the worst day of all, we call it Good Friday. But it is a Holy Week, and Friday is still good. And the events we're reflecting on this morning still have the power to change lives today, if we let the story of Jesus become our story too. He was born in some obscure village, the child of a young peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then, for three years, he was a travelling preacher. He never went to college, wrote a book, held any position of authority, or travelled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. Yet today he remains at the centre of the human race. Stay with me now as we look at the life of a man called Jesus, who, on a Friday 2,000 years ago, saved the world. And this is how it all began. It was the spring of AD 30, and on Sunday, the first day of the week, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a colt. He rode into the ancient capital city of the Jewish nation in a final and grand public demonstration for everyone to see. The huge crowds who lined the route were so excited they could hardly contain themselves. They were cheering and celebrating. Some even spread their coats on the dry and dusty road for him to ride over. It was the last week of his life, but of course no one really knew that then. For the last three years Jesus had been preaching and teaching and now his amazing life was about to come to a dramatic end. He'd made many friends, but the religious leaders hated his guts and they schemed to kill him. While he was staying in a little village called Bethany, the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, were meeting in the high priest's palace to arrange for his arrest and execution. You see, Jesus was a breath of fresh air as he spoke out against religion and its endless rules and regulations. Instead, Jesus talked about abundant life through knowing God, and this new life was for everyone. They'd been watching him a long time Waiting to see him slip Everything they saw They couldn't find a flaw Yet they longed to have him Under their grip 
one of the twelve apostles, Judas Iscariot, went to talk to the leading priests. He secretly offered to hand Jesus over to them. The priests he talked to were delighted and promised to pay Judas some money for his information. So Judas returned and he watched for the opportune moment. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas came towards him. With Judas were many people carrying swords and clubs. They'd been sent from the leading priests and religious teachers and the Jewish elders. Judas had planned a signal for them. The man I meet first with the kiss of greeting is Jesus. Arrest him. So Judas went straight over to Jesus and greeted him with the kiss. At once the people with him grabbed Jesus and arrested him. And then every single one of Jesus' followers left him and ran away. The people kept shouting as loud as they could for Jesus to be put to death. So finally he was handed over for execution. Two criminals were also led out to be executed with Jesus and a large noisy crowd followed the grim procession. When the soldiers reached a place called Skull Hill, they nailed all three men to rough wooden crosses by their hands and feet. The crowd stood watching while the religious leaders threw their insults at the dying man. Even the criminals hung next to Jesus, slagged him off. <laughs> Jesus said, Father, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. At midday, suddenly the whole country became dark. This darkness lasted for three entire hours. Then, at three o'clock, Jesus lifted his voice and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then finally, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Aah! and breathed his last. Oh, sacred head so wounded With grief and shame weighed down Now scornful is At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn into two pieces from the top to the bottom. And when the army officer who was standing in front of the cross saw what happened when Jesus died, he said, this man really was the son of God. It was on the Friday that they ended it all. Of course, they didn't do it one by one. They weren't brave enough. All the stones at the one time, or no stones thrown at all. They did it in the crowds. In crowds where you can feel safe and lose yourself, and shout things you would never shout on your own, and do things you would never do if you felt the camera was watching you. It was a crowd in the church that did it, and a crowd in the civil service, and a crowd in the street, and a crowd on the hill that did it. And he said nothing. He took the insults, the bruises, the spit on the face, the thongs on the back, the curses in the ears. He took the sight of his friends turning away, running away. And he said nothing. He let them do their worst, 
until their worst was done, as on Friday they ended it all, and would have finished themselves, had he not cried, Father, forgive them, and begun the revolution. So there it is, the ugly shape of beautiful wood, rough hewn by human hands. Lord, where are you now? And there it is, a tight shut tomb, a borrowed grave, sealed with stone and silence. Lord, where are you now? And there it is, your broken body, shrouded in linen clothed in darkness. Lord, where are you now? 
and somewhere stand your people, crying, though tired of crying, their eyes sore and bloodshot. They will not sleep tonight. Lord, where are you now? And here are we, saying, if only, counting the cost for once of our carelessness and our lovelessness and our sin. Trying so vainly to gain it all, we've bartered you away in the transaction. We've lost the one who found us. We wait, for only you can tell whether we are worth rising for. Lord, where are you now? Lord, where are you now? It's the understandable question we all ask when life deals us, and those we love, the hardest, bitterest blows. This week is called Holy because it's our chance to reflect on something amazing, that God sent his Son, Jesus, into this world, a human being just like you and me, who actually did nothing but good, but who was prepared to suffer hideously and die an appalling death to sweep away all the sin in our lives and to offer to everyone the way to an everlasting life. And Good Friday? Jesus, hanging on the cross, is saying to each one of us, in the most painful times of your life, I am with you. Your body and your mind aren't here. You can't think straight. You're floating on air because you, 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 it's not happening to you. It happens to other people, but not to you. And you just can't coordinate your things. You're numb. You're numb to things that are happening around you. You just don't believe that it's happened. And the, the hurt is, is, is unbelievable. I was working in Italy at the time. It was August. My family rang the firm where I worked up and they got in touch with my boss who was out with us in Italy. And he told me he came around the corner and with a bottle of whiskey and said, sit down. So I says, why, what's wrong? He says, Robert's been knocked down. They was on holiday because uh, they broke up for the, the, the summer holidays. And he'd gone across the main road using the Pelican Crossing to call for his friend. Uh, his friend wasn't in, so he turned round, was coming back home, got to the Pelican Crossing, pressed the button, the lights changed to red for the cars, the green man started beeping. He set off and the woman didn't stop at the lights and knocked him down. <laughs> They got me a flight back, but it was the next morning and uh, it, it seemed a lifetime waiting for the next day before I could set off home. I, w I just felt as if I was on another planet. You know, I got on the plane, got to Manchester, and the police was waiting for me to take me to LGI in Leeds. And uh, I got in the car and was coming over the M62 and I says, if anything happens to our Robert, I'll kill that woman. When I got back to LGI, uh, my wife came to meet me and she says it doesn't look good. The doctors came to see us and said that he was brain dead, that if he survived, he'd just be a cabbage. And we talked about him and we said, well, he wouldn't want that because he wasn't that sort of person. He was lively, bouncy, energetic. He talked about turning the machine off uh, that kept him alive. So we, we decided that they would switch the ventilator off at six o'clock. What do you think Jesus looks like? Like my daddy with brown hair but not the glasses and a longer beard perhaps. Maybe he's like us. Do you know like when we're not in trouble Maybe like that. The 
would turn the uh, ventilator off at six o'clock, and we we were there when he died, and that was I think that was the hardest thing I had to do him in, in my life. So I prayed that night that Jesus would help me to forgive the woman that killed him. Jesus saved me from doing something to that woman that I totally regret, that it would have wrecked my family as well. I never thought about the funeral, but Denise said that I would like Robert to be buried, and he was buried at church at Eden. I didn't know this, but people were praying for us at church, and we started going to church then because Robert was buried there, and we took flowers up every Sunday. And then I got into a, a Bible study, but my wife wouldn't go because she blamed God. She blamed God for taking our son. And we were still praying for Denise, and one Sunday she came to know him, and she could forgive that woman. It was very, very hard, but Jesus helped us through this situation. So what happened to Jesus on that first Good Friday? Oh, really sad, really painful. They whipped him, they nailed him, and then he died. It must have hurt him to lose his son. I could relate to that. Why did Jesus have to die? To clean away all our souls and to clean away all our bad sins. He died for us, so everyone would have like a nice time around the world. Because what you have to do is you have to think of other people, not yourself. Afterwards, I didn't really blame the woman because when I got my senses together, you realise that, well, it could be me. It could be me going through a red light. We all drive, we all make mistakes. And I just felt sorry for her that she has got to live with this for the rest of her life. To put your trust, your complete trust, in someone or something and to be able to do it is a very precious gift. And the risen Christ says, trust me. All you who worry, all who are concerned, all you people who are carrying so much burden that you feel you can't carry it any longer or any further, well, come to me. No matter if you're worn out with worry, I'll give you the rest that the world can't give you. So what happened to Jesus on Easter morning? He came back to life. Every year, the first sign of Bruet, the first green shoot of corn, fills me with wonder. I can't explain what happens. And the good thing is, I don't need to know. All I need is the faith to put the seed in the ground and the belief that it will grow. No more do I know how God raised Jesus on that first Easter day. But like the barley and the oats, it calls for faith and belief.
Can you believe that there are special moments that remind me of the miracle I witness every time I see a lamb born? To see a newborn lamb take its first breath, a process that must continue uninterrupted for the rest of its life, really does fill me with wonder. Easter and Jesus' resurrection speaks of new life. And if I'm privileged to see God creating life right in front of my eyes as a shepherd, why should I question his ability to create eternal life? Looking back at his life on earth, I suppose in many respects Jesus could be seen as something of a failure. He was born into poverty and he seemed happiest wandering through the small towns and villages surrounding the coast of Galilee, preaching to the poor and unimportant. He didn't even have many friends. In fact, they all eventually abandoned him and one of them even betrayed him. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property that he had on earth. Yet three days later, he was alive again just as he'd promised, and that's the power of that very first Easter. Jesus was and is the only way to God. His coming into the world proves that God cares and wants to get to know us all. This friendship with God is like a wonderful gift. Whoever, wherever you are, Jesus is for you. On the programme next Sunday, we'll be celebrating the completion of this story, the great feast of Easter, the very heart of our Christian faith, Jesus rising from the dead to show us the way to everlasting life. And our Easter Day programme will be brought to us by the choristers and the ministry team at the Islands Cathedral in Peel. It'll be a wonderful celebration in words and a premiere of some very special Easter music. I do hope you'll join us at half past nine next Sunday, or if it's more convenient for you, At Your Service is available as a podcast from 7am each Sunday morning, and you can access it easily from our website, manxradio.com. Music is a really important part of this programme, so do please let me know if there's something you'd specially like to hear in future weeks. You can email me, judithlay at manxradio.com, Or you can write to me here at Manx Radio, P.O. Box 1368, Douglas IM 991SW. And that's all that we have time for this week. This is Judith, praying that you and those you care about will have a truly holy week, knowing the depth of God's love for each one of us. Thank you for listening. I wish you a very good morning. Radio